Yes, uh, he's been Dutchess County historian for ever? A decade? <laughs> How long has it been? It's, it's ten coming years. up on ten, ten years. years. Ten years, all right, okay. Um, but it feels like he, he has given a handful of talks here, often on early American history related to the town of Washington. Yes. Um, and this is a new one. This is a debut tonight, right? This is a debut. You've never given this talk I've before. I've never given this talk before. So I'll turn it over to Will. All right. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Robert. Can folks in the back more or less hear me? No, my wife says who's sitting right in the back. The challenge for me tonight is to make sure that I say all the right things because we're actually in a topic zone that is more my wife Elizabeth's specialty than mine. So I'm counting on David to jump up and tell me when I get things wrong about the history of Washington. You're always right. And then I'm counting on Elizabeth to jump up and uh, tell me when I get things wrong about all the clothing stuff. So between the three of us, we should have a great presentation tonight. So before we get started, one last thing. Can you hear me okay out there? I can crank this up a little bit more. If you suddenly stop hearing me, a wave, stand up, throw something, I'm not very particular about this. All right, so before, as um, Robert has said, I've tended to come to you with presentations and stories about documents that are not actually here in the town of Washington or the village of Millbrook. These are you know, items that are in Poughkeepsie or elsewhere, so I'm bringing the stories to you from outside. This occasion, for the first time, not only am I debuting a presentation on the source, but I'm also focusing a program for you on something that is here in your community in the possession of the Millbrook Historical Society, and that is the Mabbitt Store Ledger. And you can see, well, most of you I hope can see, this is the inside front page of it. It's an 18th century book, and back, gosh, I guess last summer, the Society very kindly gave me permission to take it to Poughkeepsie and to image it, because our county clerk, Brad Kendall, purchased some excellent imaging equipment back in 2017. And with things changing because of COVID, we've had um, some free time on the machine. So he started the Archival Imaging Initiative. And the whole idea behind this is that we, the county, go out to the local historical societies and say, hey, do you have stuff that you would like to have imaged? Because normally imaging costs a fairly respectable amount of money. And when the historical societies say yes, then um, we do it for free because the whole idea is to preserve these sources in perpetuity because God forbid happen, anything happen to any of the originals and also to make them more accessible. So for example, the Millbrook Historical Society now has uh, multiple format digital versions of all of these scans that can be made available and uh, you know tonight's our first trial of that because all of the images you see tonight have been generated, well, except for things other than the Mavic Store Ledger, have been generated through that project. So what exactly are we talking about here? If I can get my remote to work. All right, hopefully that is the only, not yet, the only technology snafu tonight. All right, so Mavit. You probably know that there was a hamlet at one time and probably still is called Mavitsville. And you may have, in the process of driving past Millbrook on your way to Eastern Duchess, seen this enormous, awesome brick edifice on the side of the road with a cemetery behind it. That edifice is the Nine Partners Meeting House from 1782, a few uh, later editions. And adjacent to it used to stand this building, and this is another image from the Millbrook Historical Society collections. This, uh, when it was actually created, was the Nine Partners Boarding School. So it was a building that was used for the instruction of boys and girls by the Quaker community here in Millbrook from 1796 until 1863. But the building, which no longer stands, has an older history, and that history is li uh, linked to a fellow named Samuel Mabbitt. So Samuel and his son Joseph, who figures a little bit more prominently in tonight's presentation, immigrated from Long Island to Dutchess County around 1760, built a portion of the structure you see here, and then later expanded it into being a sort of combination store, tavern, and lodgings. And this was one of the major retail points, not just for what we today think of as Millbrook or Washington, but really for all of 
central and eastern duchess, the names that we have in this document you can trace to pretty much the entire Route 22 corridor today. So there's your uh, image of what this store looked like. It no longer exists, but the book does. So initially the thinking was this was Samuel Mabbitt's book until we opened it up and saw written inside the name Joseph Mabbitt. So who is Joseph? Joseph is Samuel's son. So they come up together in 1760. They're clearly uh, in business together. And there has been some work written. We won't get into it too deeply tonight because that's a whole other kettle of fish about Samuel's loyalties during the Revolution. And that he might have been a little bit, perhaps actually quite extremely pro-British rather than with the Patriot cause, which is interesting because in 1774, when Dutchess County decided, yeah, all right, we're going to send representatives to the Continental Congress down in Philadelphia, that meeting took place in what was then Charlotte Precinct, part of which is the town of Washington today. So clearly this was disputed territory. His son Joseph inscribed in the front cover of this book a, a little ditty which suggests that you know, maybe he just wanted everyone to get along, because what it says, and I apologize for the folks in the back who can't quite see it, is God save the king and bless the land in plenty, joy, and peace. God grant henceforth that foul debates twixt noble men may cease. So, you know, get over your arguments, buy more rum, everything will be okay. <laughs> so in terms of the artifact itself, you have the front cover on your left, the back cover on your right, and uh, the front page inner portion here open. Now one thing that is not really clear until you get close to the scan or until you um, actually see the book itself. It's about the first 90 pages have been ripped out of it. So we're not quite beginning in the middle, but we are beginning way down the line in terms of where this book originally started with its data. So this is July 1773, and I should note that there is an earlier store ledger for the Mavits down at the New York Historical Society that starts in 1760. So we have more data points, and what I hope to do moving forward is to connect the data in this book to other store ledgers as uh, we continue to build towards a little event coming in a few years that I'll provide a few brief remarks on at the end. So this is the artifact itself. Now, why does this ledger matter? Clearly, it's not a, a great piece of art. It's not something that would necessarily immediately draw you in. As you'll see when we get to the close-ups, it's kind of like, all right, I can sort of read this, but what does it mean? Because it's 18th century bookkeeping at its finest, but not 18th century handwriting or spelling at its finest. So there are a couple of things that uh, we can say right off the top in terms of the so what. The first part is, I mean, who here likes shopping? And I'm mean just shopping for anything. Who likes to get stuff? I don't see any hands raised, but I see some knocking. So, all right. This tells us what stuff people had in Colonial Dutchess County, but also specifically in this area. So, looking at this book, we have documentation for the items that were owned by people in the area. The second thing that we see is how Dutchess County was connected to the global economy. So, there is this idea that's been in circulation probably since the 1870s, no joke that, oh, way back in the old and colonial times, and especially out in the country, away from the cities, everyone made everything they used. Mm -hmm. From, like, the clothing on their backs, to the shoes on their feet, to their food, to everything. Well, this is one of the reasons we love primary sources, because they tend to explode these ludicrous notions. And one of the things that we will see as we move through a, a brief overview of the ledger tonight is that this part of Dutchess County, which was not exactly the center of the planet, I'm sorry to say, in the 18th century, that happened in the 19th century, when the railroad arrived, was still connected all the way across the Atlantic and as well into uh, Asia and Africa. So we'll see evidence of that along the way. We also have little bits and pieces here and there that suggest some information about larger social and economic relationships within the population. Actually, we have a little hint of that down here. So just to, to read this out for you, this is Samuel Burlingame's account. He has purchased one pound of tobacco by daughter. So, and that's transcribed below. This could mean one of two things. Either he has purchased it for his daughter, 
possibility, or his daughter has come into the store and said, I want a pound of tobacco, put it on Dad's bill. <laughs> and uh, having looked at this book for a couple of days, but not really even close to long enough because of the amount of information contained in it, I'm going to say that this was actually an example, and these and similar examples, of folks coming in and saying, I want this and that, and put it on someone's tab, and eventually Samuel or Joseph or you know, perhaps one of their taller, well-muscled cousins would settle that bill well, eventually. And then finally, the way that we've seen this and other sorts of store ledgers used over time has really been by genealogists, because the study of the stuff is a relatively new thing for historians, very old thing for museum people. But, uh, you know, the museum people tend to like to study the actual artifacts, They've left the written word to the historians, and now the historians have said, oh, we've got written documentation that describes the artifacts and puts them in a human context. Maybe we should marry the two. That's called material culture studies. It's about 20 to 30 years old, which is very young for a, an academic discipline. But um, before that, how these items were used is to figure out, okay, who's living where? Because we don't necessarily have census data, we have tax rolls, and that will tell you where the X, Y, and Z man of the house was living in a certain geographical area. But here we have uh, an opportunity to see not only that folks were living within relatively easy for the period at least access to the store, but also that you have this wider geographical network of people that is connected through one retail location. And if that isn't a sales pitch for uh, keep it local, I don't know what it is. <laughs> All right, so this is the first full page spread of the Mabbitt Ledger, and uh, you have page 92 over here and page 93 over here, which is why I say we've lost about the first 90 pages out of this book. There is still a hope that they will turn up, and uh, as David always reminds me, Millbrook has a great record in part because of the calendars that you all put out every year of folks discovering treasures above their laundry uh, machines or in their attics. So we keep our fingers crossed that the first 90 pages will come up. But as you can see, you've got names, you've got stuff and quantities of stuff, and then you've got the complicated pre-decimal British currency system. You know, how many pence to the shilling and shillings to the pound. I have it written down somewhere so that I don't actually have to remember it, because that would take up most of my memory capacity, probably. So when you look at this, it's like, all right, this is great. We've got a lot of data here, because you've got people's names. You've got economic transactions. You've got, as we saw with the, uh, the by the daughter, and we see others here by John Kuhn, for example, evidence of economic and social relationships. This is chock full of data, but it's data that is not easy to access, which is why tonight's presentation is entirely based on only the first seven pages of this ledger, of about 150 pages of data. Because what you have to do, pulling back the historian curtain for you, is put all of that into a spreadsheet like this. And this is something I learned how to do a very long time ago, so don't look at this and think, wow, this is the cutting edge. It's not. <laughs> it was the cutting edge in 2002. But uh, you enter your, your data with your, your names and then your item. You like to record the actual spelling, quantity, unit, and then we have a, a column here that records all of those notes that imply economic and social relationships between individuals. So I ended up with 271 transactions, and I'm emphasizing transactions here because these do not reflect the actual quantities of material purchase. These, uh, this numerical analysis reflects the amount of times a certain item appears within these transactions. So that's our data set, 271. I've broken it down into some overarching categories just to keep it manageable and simple because my eyes were beginning to cross after I read the 21st entry on purchasing rum. <laughs> so first we have textiles because guess what folks, the whole idea of homespun is not really a thing when you're in the British Empire and the British Empire connects you and what is today Millbrook with fabric factories, not only in Great Britain, but also as far away as the Indian subcontinent. 
because are you going to learn how to weave all of this stuff yourself? It's a really intense process. Or are you going to buy that for basically pennies on the dollar because it's been made by water-powered mills in um, Great Britain, or it's been made by these tremendous factories that are operating in India and had been since before the British arrived. So, textiles. 73 transactions involve textiles. That's over a quarter of everything in that first seven pages. So this accounts for a lot of trade, both here in Millbrook and we know from studies elsewhere throughout the 13 colonies. You don't make the clothes, or you don't make the cloth that's on your back. You also normally don't make the clothing that's on your back. But the cloth itself comes from far away. Liquor, not a big surprise. It's 18th century Dutchess County, you know. No movie theaters, no skating rinks, no pool halls, not a whole lot of else to do. And uh, besides recreational use, liquor does have some preservative value. It's a way to maintain certain items from the harvest for consumption, like, uh, you know, in February, when it's so cold outside, you don't want to go out, whether it's 18th century Dutchess County or 21st century Dutchess County. So liquor, we have 52 transactions, 19, you know, trending towards another quarter of everything that is being sold out of this data set. Then we have ceramics and manufactured goods. These are the things that you need to live a civilized life, but that you do not either want to learn how to make, because you're talking about a seven to eight year apprenticeship to learn how to make each of these items, or because it's you just don't have the time, but you do have the money. And uh, I skipped over, so fabric makes up over half of the textiles transactions. Rum makes up like 85% of the liquor, so out of 52 transactions, 45 of them are for rum. And we're not talking like a little dram or a shot of rum. We're talking about smallest amount, half gallon, and up. Yeah. So that's rum for your liquor, for your ceramics and manufactured goods. 45 transactions, 17% of all the transactions in the set. The major item is skites. So that's the thing that you use to harvest weed or to mow your lawn because it's the 18th century and the push mower hasn't been invented quite yet. We have 20 transactions, so about half of the manufactured goods are this key item for agriculture, and we'll get to why that is along the way. And then finally, we have food products because just because it's the 18th century doesn't mean you can't go to the store and buy stuff. You don't have to raise everything you consume. And they had all sorts of methods to preserve material. And we'll see some examples of that. But the big food items, no real surprise here, tea and sugar, neither of which really come from close by. Sugar technically does come from this hemisphere, at least, because it's grown and processed in the Caribbean. But the tea that they're getting here is coming out of the Indian subcontinent. And it is not high quality tea. I want to stress that because I've made the mistake in previous uh, presentations of talking about, oh, this marvelous tea, and then actual tea drinkers have come up to me with a really sad face and said, this is not what Harneys would be selling today, but they're <laughs> drinking back then. So uh, a little foreshadowing here, we're going to proceed through each of these categories and give you some examples of what we see in this book and how it relates to those larger ideas in the the so what category. <coughs> All right, so first thing we've got here, and I'm going to turn slightly, is an entry for a guy named Michael Byrne, probably potentially actually Michael Burns, because a lot of this stuff is spelled phonetically, <coughs> so it helps when you read it out loud if you don't know what a word is. And he's essentially, through all of this, buying the material that he needs <coughs> for a suit coat for the 18th century. 18th century was the period when men always wore three-piece suits. This was pretty much it from 1660 until like 1970. So at the top, you've got what looks like Maureen, which, you know, nice Irish name. It's St. Patrick's Day, but this is actually the cloth Maureen, and that is the, the exterior fabric of this garment. You've got Shaloon, which is a lighter weight wool. That's going to be the lining. You've got mohair. This is used to do the buttonhole stitches, because no zippers until the 1920s. You've got, uh, what have we got, two canes of silk. That is actually silk sewing thread. 
We've got buchrum, which is buckram, that's interfacing to make it all look nice because in the 18th century, you don't so much wear the coat as the coat wears you. And then uh, a dram, which at first I thought, ah, wrong, because what sewing project shouldn't begin with a little pick me up? And then I ran this by a colleague of mine, Mark Hutter, who is the, the um, tailor down at Colonial Williamsburg, and he said, oh no, they measured thread in drams as well as alcohol. But, and he also said, though, this wouldn't be the first tailor to sell alcohol, and then I had to tell him not to sell it. So you see how all of these seemingly like random pieces of information can be pulled together to give you an idea of, all right, so we don't really have portraits of anyone in Dutchess County at the time. We don't have surviving garments from the time. But through something like the Maddox for Ledger, we can at least say what it's made out of. And to illustrate that point, what is Maureen? Well, this is what Maureen is. It is um, a woolen textile that has a ribbed appearance because when you think about woolens, you have your warp and your weft, or maybe it's your weft and your warp. But either way, one of those and the fabric Maureen is a really thick woolen fiber. The other is a more refined, thinner woolen fiber. So it's a ribbed appearance, and you can do all sorts of crazy things with this, put patterns into it and whatnot. I doubt that's what this guy was getting, because he ordered six yards of it, which is not quite enough to do curtains. Like, literally, folks, that's not, a, not enough to do curtains in the 18th century, which is the other thing that uh, this textile was used for. Other types of fabric that we've seen so far, and again, first seven pages only, buckram, that's that interlining. Calico, in the 18th century, it is a printed cotton. So that is coming from India or being made in England to look like it came from India because knockoffs are not an invention of 20th century New York City. You've got cambric, which is a style of linen, checked linen, drilling, more linen, nankeen, which is cotton textile, shalloon we mentioned is a lining wool, and then even silk taffeta. They are only making that stuff in the Far East at this period in time. So you see how in basically one entry you have a, another representation of a global economy. Alright, bonnet paper. So this is another thing that, uh, that we see every now and again, which is these weird entries that don't make sense to me, and I've kind of been poking around this stuff for 20 years. So up here we have Edward Whalen. Yes, that name goes all the way back. And he has what looks like one Bennett paper. It's like, but Bennett College didn't begin until the 20th century. Oh, never mind. If you look at it sideways, you're like, oh, that could be bonnet paper. And then you come down here, and the, um, the aptly named Relief Knickerbocker, a little New England influence there, has got listed, among other things, bonnet paper here. So what is bonnet paper? Do you use it for making bonnets? Well, actually, yes, I gave it away. You do use it for making bonds. Here's the human interest part of the story tonight. These are friends of mine, uh, mother and daughter, and on their heads you see 1770s style bonnets. So that big brim of the bonnet is actually silk-covered paper. And if you go back and look at what else Relief is getting, she's getting a quarter yard of uh, what here is called taffety, but is silk taffeta. And that is exactly what this stuff is made out of. So another example of how this seemingly bizarre source can give you an almost physical picture into the past. Alright, so that's enough textiles, I know. There are only like three or four of us in here that enjoy that stuff. But liquor has a more universal appeal, right? It's something that we've all experienced at one time or another or frequently in our lives. And it was certainly a mainstay of 18th century life. So here you have your various bottles, because every different type of liquor has its own form of bottle. And one of the things that we see folks buying at the Mabbit store are bottles, because the Mabbits are not like if you buy a gallon of rum, they aren't handing you a gallon of jug, or a gallon jug of rum. They're saying, all right, we're going to tap this huge hogshead of rum, bring your own, you know, the whole idea of the growler. It's nothing new. Bring your own receptacle, and uh, we'll give you a gallon. So that is a rum bottle on the left there, then a wine bottle on uh, the right, and then three different kinds of gin bottles, because the English were big into gin, despite the fact that we have no evidence that the Mabbits were selling it here in Dutchess County. But 
I don't make the pictures, I just find them on the internet. <laughs> what we do have here, the types of beverages that are being sold, so rum, 45 out of these 50 odd entries, that's not a real surprise because it's part of the triangle trade, which of course begins in Africa with enslaved persons being brought to the Caribbean to actually do a lot of the work that not only results in sugar, but also results in rum. That rum is then brought up to North America, traded for various and sundry raw materials that are brought back to England and turned into manufacturers, the sale of which uh, in part not only powers colonial America, but also powers the slave trade down in Africa. Triangle trade in less than 30 seconds. So that's where that rum is coming from. The spirits, we don't really know what they are. And I'm not sure that that's really a coincidence. It might have been the smell semi-alcoholic, so we will sell it as a spirit. It could also have been uh, the other types of spirits that are used in more mechanical operations. We've got wine, only two instances of wine being purchased, and then just one brandy. But in another one of these examples of social relationships being revealed, we have here Thomas Casey, and uh, there is one gallon of rum charged to his account, and as you can see here, and to quote it, per Negro boy. So this is probably an enslaved young male person of color, because we know that slaveholding happened throughout Dutchess County, and that in fact the Quakers were deeply involved. This is what leads to the later Hicksite schism with the Quakers between those who think it's fine to have people enslaved, and others who really strongly believe to the contrary. So there's an example of where we see uh, an enslaved relationship that we otherwise probably wouldn't have any records of because they were not taking censuses at this point in time. Moving right along to what I actually like the most is ceramics. And, uh, my wife can tell you that our house is filled to exploding with ceramics. And don't worry, there's a joke about that at the end. But this stuff represents tea consumption. So if you're going to have tea, you're going to have the proper things to, to make it in and to consume it from. You're not going to, you know, drink tea from little earthenware pots that you happen to make on site. No, you're going to get this stuff, which looks a lot like it might have been made in China or Japan, right? Again, knockoffs. This was actually made in London to look like it was made in China or Japan, something they've been doing since the 17th century. It's called Delft, and in true English fashion, they stole that from the Dutch, who were actually the first to begin making Delft, and still do make it today. The English just added a little bit more color, so you'll see that this um, cup and saucer from Colonial Williamsburg, it took a long time for handles to become part of the teacup, and the uh, initial couple of centuries of its use by the Western world, there were no handles in part because you would be served your tea in the cup and then you would pour it in your saucer and drink it from there in order to allow it to cool. Which is why sometimes, and this is up on its edge so you can see the design, but if you can see it in cross section, it's pretty cupish, more than saucerish. And then of course, if you're going to be drinking tea out of cups, you have to have a proper vessel to serve it. And that's your teapot down here, which is an example of what is uh, known in the collecting field as agate ware. It's manufactured in Staffordshire, England. So that sort of stuff would have been retailed out of the Mavit store because it's not being made in America, at least not in this point in time. So that's all the fancy stuff, because you've got up here Thomas Mason. He orders teacups for a guy actually named Joseph Barnes' wife. So, all right, there's another example of a little hint of a social relationship in here. And then down here you have um, Joshua Haight, and he's not only getting a set of tea cups, he's also getting a, set, a tea pot to go along with it. Because you, if you have one, you kind of need the other. But not all of the ceramics would have been imported necessarily. So we have two examples of what are just called earthen pots up here with Darius Lobdell, down here with Moses Cook. This sort of thing would have been made on site, and we actually have archaeological evidence here in Dutchess County of local manufacture of pottery. You know, relatively rough stuff, because take a look at that. It's red ware, it's, it's not refined, it's not high fired, doesn't look like this at all. Still being made and recovered archaeologically today, and then we know from some other scholarship that has been conducted that 
ceramics activity here in Dutchess really picked up in the 1790s because folks decided that getting the yellow fever in the summer wasn't a good idea. So move all of the potteries from New York up to Poughkeepsie. And if you go to the Upper Landing Park today, you'll see a lovely little display and plaque about the pottery industry that flourished in Poughkeepsie till approximately the 1890s, first decade of the 20th century. See, I told you I was a ceramics nerd. Believe me next time. So they're selling all kinds of stuff from the super fancy to the super plain. Now for those who are into heavier metal type items, this is really where that whole imperial relationship, if you have your colonies for your raw materials that are shipped back to the mother country, turned into usable stuff and sold back to the colonies, comes into play. Because here actually in Dutchess, not that far east of here, was a major area for raw iron ore extraction. And thanks to a collection that we have at the county, we know that uh, certain folks living in what is today Dover were illegally refining that iron into uh, usable ore. But the whole idea is that folks working, for example, in the Irondale district up in Millerton and Northeast would pull out that raw ore. They might refine it just a little bit, just enough to get it shippable, send it to England, and in exchange you would get the stuff that Joshua Haight bought. So your iron kettle, your typical sort of witch's cauldron, if you will. You get uh, your teacups and your teapot, of course, but then knives and forks. We have three transactions of folks buying knives and forks in bulk. So they aren't eating with sharpened sticks or like a wooden spoon out here. They've got serious fancy stuff like this one from Colonial Williamsburg. And then one of my favorite one-offs in the book so far is the frying pan because there's an ongoing debate and the really close to but not actually foodways community. So there are people who study 18th century foodways and then there are those of us who look at what they're doing and kind of try to replicate it and think about it. And it's like, all right, was all food made basically in one of these? Just boil it. Because you look at English cuisine today, it's plausible. But no, you have frying pans. This particular type is known today as a spider because it's got those legs, because you're cooking on an open hearth. And uh, fire plus skin equals bad experiences for everyone. So if your frying pan comes with legs, you can just set it over those coals instead of having that nested in. It's, it's a process. So you've got other heavy manufactured goods, of course, this is the nicer variety, but the type that we're really keen on here, that's the core of the story of how you link the stuff in the store with the economic activity that's going on more broadly, are the skites and the sickles. So you'll remember that skites accounted for over half of the manufactured goods. And then the sickles, you know, they sort of keep up there, and we have for example, here, James Lettuce has ordered a sickle for himself, and this is something that Joseph Mappet, if he indeed kept this book recorded over and over again, were these folks buying things for themselves, or were they buying them for someone else? And then Thomas Wing, and we know the Wings more today as a Dover family, but they were in fact pretty broadly spread all over the place, all the way up into Stanford at one time. He is getting eight sides, so sky, scythe, you tell me. These are more or less the 18th century style of a sickle. That is a 20th century, admittedly, scythe. So this is why it's important. So this is an image of folks who are bringing in the wheat harvest in England in 1785. You look at other documents, as I have, you very quickly figure out that basically the 18th century economy, like everything, not only growing and buying and selling, but paying your rent, is based on wheat production. It is more or less an agricultural monoculture here until the 1790s when folks are like, if we make more apples, we can make cider. That would be easier to ship than wheat. So everything is wheat-based, whether you're Western Duchess, whether you're Eastern Duchess, and you've got to have stuff like this to end up with a marketable crop like that. And oh look, you have two women wearing bonds. That is actually a coincidence. I didn't plan it that way, but I'm glad it worked out that way. And how important are these sites? Well, you've got Joseph Harris here who's ordering three dozen of them and paying cash. So that's a pretty big deal because the whole idea, again, of the British Empire is 
You don't want the colonials to have hard currency because then the colonials might use that currency to buy things from the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the list goes on. So uh, Mr. Harris certainly had maybe not gold and silver, maybe some colony-issued currency, but he is not doing one of these credit arrangement things. It's like, I want 36, here's the dough. Ah. So food products, this is the stuff that has the the closest parallel with our experience today because we all presumably go to the grocery store. If any of you here actually raise everything you consume, please let me know. I'd like to learn more about <laughs> how that works. I have a backyard now, so there's always a possibility. But one of these uh, other items of continuity is some of the most popular things that are sold out of the Mabbit store in terms of food. The first of those is sugar loaves, because the last time I checked, Dutchess County in any era is not warm enough for sugar cane to grow. That's pretty much in this period an exclusively Caribbean enterprise. It's a human catastrophe down there to produce this stuff. We could go into detail, we won't necessarily unless you ask me during the questions. But how is sugar made? And it's often sold in loaves. That's what your sugar would look like for the most part coming out of the Mabbit store or a section of one of those. So you start off with sugar cane that looks like a really big piece of, what's a vegetable, not asparagus. What the, rhubarb, that's great, thank you Craig. So it looks like huge rhubarb. <laughs> you don't cut it down, your enslaved workers cut it down. They put it in a press and squeeze all of the liquid out of it, and then you put that liquid into one of these big clay forms, and then you put that into a pot. You'll notice that there's a little hole at the bottom here. What that hole does is allow the liquid component, the very lightest liquid, to drain out. All of the particulate matter that is left behind is the pure sugar. Now what you normally have here, these are modern sugar loaves, so you'll see one is brown sugar, one is white sugar. In the 18th century, you would have a sugar loaf basically in half, the bottom portion of it would be brown sugar because the contaminants settle towards the bottom. The top portion of it would be all of that white sugar that we take for granted today. So this would be removed from that clay mold, cut in half, brown sugar is taken away, packaged up, white sugar is taken away, packaged up, usually, believe it or not, in blue paper, and then sent around the world to be sold. So. The, the, pro the processes and proceeds of enslavement were uh, being readily consumed here. We also have that tea that I mentioned to Bohi tea, or Bohia tea. I always wonder about the pronunciation myself. Evidently, this is considered really crap tea today by the folks who enjoy tea. But in the 18th century, this is what the English were shipping all around, and yet it does look like shriveled up leaves, because it is just shriveled up leaves. It's not all nicely packaged for you to consume. You've got to cut it up yourself at home. But the Mabbits will sell it to you by the pound. Potentially by the cup too, but certainly by the pound. Other food products. So you've got raisins. Believe it or not, yes. 18th century. Raisins are big. Why not? Except they spell it as reasons in the Mabbit store lecture. Another example of where you have to say it out loud before it begins to make sense, because I don't know why anyone would be buying reasons from the map. It's something you're supposed to come up with yourself. You've got plums, also a type of item that can be preserved. Pork. It actually turns out that Dutchess County, at least by the late 18th, early 19th century, is a big pork producer. There are actually pork packaging concerns at all of the Hudson River docks in Dutchess County. And this is not like your country ham pork. This is like coming out of a cask filled with salty, liquidy stuff, pork. Yeah, not, not recommended for consumption. Pepper, chocolate. So this weird looking device over here is a chocolate pot. In the 18th century when we say chocolate, and really for most of the 19th century, when we say chocolate, we mean what today is called baker's chocolate. So it is the raw ingredients that come out of those cocoa beans, which again is more or less a Caribbean and Central American enterprise at this point in time. It is bitter, but it is highly caffeinated. And guess what is completely missing from the Mabbit store ledger that many of us live on today? Coffee. coffee. No coffee being sold in Dutchess County. So you're going to get your caffeine from your tea, or you're going to get it from that chocolate. And to make that chocolate more palatable, 
you melt it in a vessel like this and combine water and cinnamon and a couple of other ingredients that come from places way, way far away, and then some sugar, and then you drink it because an 18th century chocolate is not bar form consumed. It is a wonderful drink, usually uh, accompanied with a little bit of alcohol slid into that. So drinking chocolate, cinnamon, cloves, butter, all of the, uh, the standard substitu uh, standards. And down here we have Matthew Van Dusen, who is getting one pound of chocolate. That's a lowercase l there, that's not 11 chocolates. Alright, so more about the credit culture. We focused on the stuff so far because I think the stuff's amazing, and this is a very rare record of that stuff, but also included in the Matt of Score Ledger are not only, you know, X, Y, and Z being purchased for other people, but also examples of cash being paid to offset debts. In this case, you have two guys who evidently came in and bought things for each other to settle debts potentially between one another. So up top, you have John Butt, and he gets one gallon of spirits. Are they drinking spirits? Are they woodworking spirits? We'll probably never know. Per Thomas, and immediately below him, Thomas Mason gets one half yard check. That means checked linen, so think tablecloths, per butt. So right there, credit debt relationship. Um, and then finally, and this is the, the joke slide from my wife in the back, because I love collecting reproductions of 18th and early 19th century mugs. There was one entry in particular that stood out to me. Average of frost, he's getting some cotton. And that's the thing, cotton isn't really cloth at this point in time. It, it, it exists, but normally it's very expensive printed cloth coming out of it from India. From the context of the entries where it appears in here, it looks basically like it's cotton balls. And one of those entries is cotton wool. And they're clearly buying these things for, or the men are at least, for their wives. So he's getting her three pounds of cotton, and he also says down here, mug per wife. So there you go. You know, at least 200 solid years of guys buying mugs and uh, saying it's a gift for their wife, not for themselves. <laughs> here in Dutchess County. So our work cited, just a couple tonight, Nine, boarders, uh, nine Partners Boarding School gives you a, a brief but thorough history of the building itself. So not necessarily deep into the, the history of the institution. And then the other Mabbitt Store ledger that we know definitely exists is chronicled or was chronicled in the National Genealogical Society Quarterly. And there are some entries in there, but uh, none of the sort of interpretation that you've seen tonight. And one of the reasons why this store ledger and others like it are so important is in a couple of years, in 2025, we will be, in 2026, we will be going into the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. The county is already beginning to plan commemorative events. We've split the, geog the yeah, excuse me, geographical spread of Dutchess County into working groups. Washington is within Charlotte precincts because we grouped all of the towns by the colonial precincts they were part of. If you have questions, I'm happy to throw the precinct chair, Craig Marshall, under the bus, but we are busy planning away on that. And sources like the Mabbitt Ledger are absolutely essential for understanding the lived experience of people 250 years ago, and also giving us a basis by which to understand how that experience has changed, and also how that experience hasn't changed, because I'm sure all of us will at some point in the next couple of months at the very least go to the grocery store and buy some sugar, just like folks were buying sugar from Samuel and Joseph Mabbitt back in 1773. So thank you all very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. I understand that there's a lot of bargaining, not everything was paid in cash. Does that get reflected in the legislative scene? So Craig is asking that he understands there was a lot of bartering, it was a cash poor society on purpose, and was this reflected in the ledgers? I think that that is reflected throughout the Mavic Score Ledger, especially when you see entries like uh, this one here with John Butt, who he says, all right, put some spirits for Thomas uh, Mason on my account, and then Thomas Mason says, put some Czech linen on my account for Thomas or for John Butt. I suspect that reflects some kind of credit or debt that is owed in one way or another, but yes, we do see that. And these ledgers, and presumably many of these purchases are being made on credit, 
because we do have entries with a person's name, and it says cash underneath it. And up top, the way you do 18th century bookkeeping ideally is it's double entry. So your left side, if I remember this correctly, is your debit column. So that's all the stuff that they owe you. Your right side is the credit column, all of the stuff that they've given you to cancel that debt. And some of these store ledgers are set up that way, including one for the town of Clinton that is at the Dutchess County Historical Society, in which we just finished scanning about two weeks ago. So you see everything they're buying and then everything they are giving in exchange for what's being bought, a lot of which is labor. So. Well, I'll sell you X, Y, and Z, and you come work on my farm for three or four days, because how can I run the farm and run the store simultaneously? It's a question we still ask ourselves today. So, yes, that barter-ish relationship, that very complicated debt culture in colonial America is reflected in these documents. Did they balance that once a year? Or so Allison asked, year. did they balance that once a year? They seem to have balanced it whenever the person actually holding the debt, so in this case, like the Mavits, decided that it needed to be balanced. And, um, you know, that's some pretty significant social leverage that you can uh, use, which is why folks who run stores tend to be occupying pretty high ranks in colonial and then early republic society, in fact. Out in Amenia, it's the militia captain who also runs the store for what is today Amenia Union and then goes into uh, producing arms for the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. Robert. First, I have so many questions. <laughs> I have to limit myself. Um, first, let me just make one, one point. You probably will don't spend a ton of time at Morona's, our IGA down here, but for people who have gone into Morona's a lot, they have like, accounts, right? People have accounts and they don't pay when they get their groceries. And often, if you spend enough time in there, you will see employees of people who have accounts go in and say, put this on this person's account, charge this to this account. And it's the same dynamic as you see recorded here, and it's a, well, FERC hasn't entirely changed. Um, all right, one question. Do you have any sense of how Joseph Mabbitt got his stuff for his store? Like, is there a wholesaler? who is delivering products to Mavit's store. So the question is, how did the stuff that's being sold and recorded in this ledger actually get here when it comes from places like Madagascar or the Indian subcontinent or Barbados? The answer is that stuff is going through multiple middleman hands. So it would have arrived in the port of New York City. It would have been brought up on the uh, ships coming to the Hudson, to all those river docks, and Craig knows this well because he has ledgers for the Schultz family and they were involved in that trade, which tells you that yes, folks living in Central Duchess have relationships to docks that are, I think that's west, that are over on the Hudson River. And they in turn have accounts down in New York City, so the Mavits would have had their own set of debt and credit relations with relative wholesalers in the city, and the Mavits would have placed orders for stuff like, okay, I need... 17 sets of teapots and teacups whole, ship it up. I think I need this, I think I need that. And then of course, um, you know, you don't have it in stock, you can always order it for folks. For some of this stuff, I think they are getting it locally, especially given how well developed the iron industry is and not that many miles away from here by the 1770s. I would not be surprised if at least some of those sides and sickles are made locally rather than being brought in from Great Britain Things like the plain earthenware pots are basically not worth shipping anywhere. So probably made, if not nearby, within the county would be my guess. So it's that mix, and it's a mix that you have to maintain a very careful balance of. Because yes, it is a credit economy, but your ability to float that credit for long periods of time relies less on the structure of the credit system, which is the, the benefit we have today than it does on personal relationships. So just like folks who get credit at the Mavits store need to be nice to the Mavits, the Mavits have to maintain um, you know, a positive relationship with their suppliers, which could potentially explain their loyalist propensities because you're in business with these folks, you have very close connections to this imperial economy. And someone might well have uh, asked Samuel or uh, Joseph. So, 
This whole revolution thing actually works. Where's the T going to come from? What's it going to cost? It's very easy to answer that question when you're part of an imperial system that's been established since the 17th century. Very difficult to answer that question when you're part of a brand new republic. Yes, Don. Is there an element for capital for the store? Is there an element of, of where, capital? Were the Mavits, were they capital rich? Did they have partnerships? There's no banks around. I mean, technically there are no banks around. There are individuals who act as banks. My suspicion is where are the Mavits getting their capital backing to at least launch this enterprise? I don't think it's a coincidence that they come from Long Island, which is much, much closer to New York City than we are up here. I suspect they have connections down there, and maybe David knows more about this, that would have provided that initial starter capital to get the wheel turning, and then you just keep the transactions going. And clearly they're pulling from a broad area. You have names in this account book which come from modern Pauline, Dover, Amenia, Stanford, throughout the town of Washington. Um, there are a few that I think could also be up in Clinton. So the Mavit store has a very long reach in terms of its market penetration. There are other stores around. It's not that they're the only place, but... Um, sure, the, follow up. Just oh. a sub... <laughs> another one. Has uh, co-op merchandising, mercantile co-op, for those, an extent, uh, when did those come into to play? So the question is, when did merchandising co-ops come into play? I do not know, because I'm not that well versed in business history. Okay. But I'll look it up, or try to. Allison, did you have your hand raised? Um, yes. Um, I was just thinking, Craig may know this answer <laughs> again. Um, the Schultzville General Store didn't they, so this is 19th century. I guess, but they gave out loans right through the store, right? Yeah, the store started in 1807, and there's a possibility that there's a store just before that. But Schultz started in 1807. And it, doesn't it say something I had just seen? Um, when he died, when one of them died, they had about $20,000 out in loans. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. They, they had about $20,000 yes. out in loans. Yeah, he was the local bank. Yeah, yeah, right in Schultzville. Little, yeah, that's what happens. If you're the local guy with cash or a cash equivalent, you don't normally bury it in the backyard or put it in the mattress. You lend it out at interest in the community. And that's how you make your money work for you, just like if you're a large landowner. You get tenant farmers in because they make the land profitable for you. That's kind of how you can get away with starting these new ventures without banks in America. Because your banks are the local guy who has a ton of cash, and you could talk him into lending you some. Or lending you his credit line. Yes? Um, I was struck by the 36 sides that you someone bought. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that? Because that tells us about the, um, like the business operation that that person was doing, and also who was actually All right, so the question is, looking back at that one entry of, actually it's pretty far back, of 36 sites being brought, of being bought, what does that tell us about the individual who's buying them? What does that tell us about who's using them? How does this object, and this is classic material culture, how can you look at a thing and figure out a whole bunch of human stories, and including cultural assumptions, from it? So... 36 sites being bought in bulk implies one of two things for me, and I've been wondering this myself. One, that this is a major landowner, and I'd have to go look at another set of sources to figure that part out, and he is outfitting an entire crew for an, and this is in July, so it's not harvest time yet, but he could be preparing for it. On the other hand, it could be a sub-retailer, so he's running a smaller operation that was a wing, if I recall correctly, or a Harris. So they, those normally live east of here, and he could have been selling them on a more local level. But that work, the people actually using the sides, using the sickles, are not enslaved individuals normally. 
because enslaved individuals in Dutchess County tend to be skilled tradespeople of one sort or another. They are there because they have a technical specialty. The reason that you don't use enslaved labor for that is because you have groups like the German Palatine immigrants who start way up in Red Hook, where I currently live, and make their way all the way into Dover and Palm, believe it or not. These are not only your tenant farmers, these were also your casual laborers. So what you would do during the 18th century and for a goodly part of the beginning of the 19th century is kind of like the cowboy motif of, all right, you've got a big um, herd that you need to move, so you're going to go out and hire a bunch of guys. Well, you know the wheat crop is going to be coming in and needs to be harvested. You're going to hire 36 laborers to do this for you who are just going to be there for the harvest and then go away so you don't have to pay for their upkeep and find a place for them to live and all of this other sort of stuff. That ties in with the always murky issue of inheritance because we're at that dividing line between partable inheritance, which means every child gets something, and that's the New England style, versus the eldest child or the eldest male child, primogeniture, gets everything. It's a mix here in Dutchess County, but in both cases, there's not a whole lot of land to go around. So you end up drawing these seasonal agricultural laborers from the younger sons of the tenant farmers, who in many cases are trying to pull together the resources to either move up into what is now Washington County, which was actually settled by a ton of people from this area, including the Merritts, or far, far west, especially after the revolution, that whole burned over district, and, and still somewhat called that today, central New York, where after the Continental Army went through it in 1779, they're headed out there for land claims. But until they leave, they're young, they don't really necessarily have a whole lot to do on the home farm, so they're renting themselves out. Yes, Craig? A little bit confused. You know, when I go shopping, I get a whole list of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if I have to go a distance, I'm going to get a bunch of stuff. But I don't see a bunch of the blood entries here. Why is that? So Craig is asking when he goes shopping, and also when I go shopping too, you make a big long list of things that you need, and then you go and buy them all in bulk. But what we see with the ledger, and in fact you can see it here, so Albert Adrian shows up and buys one fine comb. It's like, all right, how many miles did you travel to get this one thing? A couple of explanations potentially for that. One is that people just didn't have that much stuff back in this period of time. So, you know, if you really needed a comb, you would make the trip to get it. The other part of it is that they may have been doing other business and either passing by the store or were conducting that business in the environs of the store. So, for example, if you were bringing in a wheat crop, you might be bringing that into the Mavit store somewhere near the Mavit store so that everyone's wheat can be carried on the same load of wagons. And we do have some entries in here on carting of various and sundry goods that the Mavits are being paid for. So, if they're bringing in the wheat and they're like, well, you know, I'm here and I need a comb because my other one broke, so I'm going to get that and then head home. So I think it's probably a combination of those two factors and that, yeah, the myth of homespun everything is a myth, but on the other hand, they were generating a lot more of their daily consumables on site than we are today. Because once the Poughkeepsie Journal starts rolling in the 1780s, 1784 specifically, and you start looking at these ads for farms that are being sold, they've got everything on there. It's not just, you know, the, the fields with the wheat, you've got the blacksmith shop, you've got dairy operations on most of these farms, you've got cider presses and orchards attached to them. Now that's a good 20 years after this period. But at the same time, one of the benefits of being a dominant agrarian society is that the stuff you have to get every day, the stuff that I go to the grocery store to get, you are raising and processing there. It's just when you need those raisins that you have, or that rum, and then you preserve the raisins by floating them in the rum when you have to go visit the mountains. Yes, sir? Do you see patterns in the data, either, I mean, to the extent that there's information on the time of day that people are buying from the day of the week, or even the month of the year? So I'm thinking there could be, you know, everyone's buying their rum on Friday. 
So these, uh, yeah, these first of January, what it's called. These first seven pages cover July third, fourth, and fifth, seventeen seventy-three, <laughs> in two hundred and seventy-one transactions. So we will have that data as we continue to process this source. They don't really give you the time of day, and part of what's confusing is, and this may speak to uh, Craig's question earlier is you can have the same guy enter three different times the same day. Why? <laughs> is it because he's working with three different clerks? Is it because the clerks are like scribbling stuff down and then at the end of the day you present Joseph Mabbitt with this pile of scraps of paper or his bookkeeper? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, enter this before you head home. Make sure the fire is out before you go. Sometimes the data gives us questions more than it actually gives us answers. Mm -hmm. Yes? So you don't think they were entering it as they were purchasing it? I do not get the impression, and this is something that I draw from 18th century sources in general, because you don't see pencil written 18th century sources. The stuff that survives to be seen today is almost exclusively in pen. And my suspicion is that they're making some kind of scratch notation on the spot, and then at the end of the day, especially since they're effectively running lines of credit, so it's not like they have to keep track of the cash box. At the end of the day, then they enter all of this stuff. And that's a working theory. I'm not married to it, but um, it does seem to explain what we have from the physical evidence and the way this stuff is crazily entered. And again, this ledger, for all of its wonderful, layered, like, headachey level causing of information is not your standard form of bookkeeping because it doesn't have credit on one side and debit on the other or vice versa. So this does look like something that was, was kept as maybe an end of the day register and then the data may have been transferred to a more formal account book at some point later on. Ah, three hands. All right, Jonathan, you haven't asked. What about taxes? What about taxes? <coughs> well, your taxes in the 18th century were not on commercial transactions. They were on property. And uh, the, one, the one item where there was a tax, there was an excise tax on liquor sales. But in that case, you were supposed to keep a record of how much liquor you sold. And then when the tax assessor came around to be like, all right, you've got 50 acres, and this year, our magical math says you pay two pounds in property taxes. How much liquor did you sell this year? Um, you just presume everyone's telling the truth. <laughs> Robert. Okay, two things. First, to go back to what you were saying a second ago, almost all of the food and beverage things that are listed here are things that are not produced here. Um, with the exception of butter and maybe pork? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe pork. I mean... I don't suppose there are any pig farmers in the room, are there? Pork production is a very specialized form of agriculture. Pigs are very different from cows. They tend to destroy things with much greater frequency than cows. So, And pork is one of those items that in the 18th century is very easy to, to process into a form that can be sent elsewhere. We only have the one entry for it, and I half suspect that that was being purchased by someone who probably wanted some pork, but didn't either live near someone or wasn't willing to butcher their pigs. Because the whole, you know, if you're a southerner, these are one of the things that they program into you at an early age because barbecue is so central to the cuisine. But there is a specific time of the year that is hog butchering time. You do not butcher hogs at any other part of the year. So if you have a hankering for pork and it's not November, and you're going to have to go find it somewhere other than the pig that is maybe on your property. So my, my question is, do you have any theory about who is buying butter at a store at this time? Like, this is somebody who lives alone and doesn't have someone who's going to make butter? And... It could be. It could be a, a smaller farmer who does not have a dairy operation on hand. It could be one of those debit transaction, debit credit relationships where the Mavits, you know, someone has come up and said, all right, I want to settle my accounts, look at all the butter. Oh, they're like, okay, so that. there's going to be a sale on butter this week, and uh, let everyone know you can take a break from the churn and just come get it here repaired. So these are all sort of 
things I throw around in the air, but you know, the next stage after making that huge spreadsheet of all of this data is to then begin tracking the names in so far as they can. The other thing I was going to ask is, so this is 1773 and 1774? It is. Yes. Okay, so we're in the midst of kind of heightening tensions leading up to the revolution. By this point, at least in some of the colonies, there are organized boycotts in place of British goods. I realize that this is three days from you know one ledger here, and so it's hard to make comparisons. But I wonder if it's do you think it'll eventually be possible to make some conclusions about are people buying less tea in response to this boycott campaign? Is what you know the products that people are buying changing in response to the, the political environment? Okay, so the question is, there's a boycott on English manufactured goods and imperial imports like tea. You've all heard of the Tea Party in 1774. So that's part of the answer to the question. 1773, it hasn't hit. So 1774, there is a boycott, but it's not a universal boycott. Not everyone boycotts English goods. This is where your division between your loyalists and your revolutionaries begins to happen, and not there are geographical nodes to this. So you see much more effective boycotting happening in cities and in areas, for example, in the South, where a handful of really elite people consume the vast majority of these high status goods. In an area like the Hudson Valley, where you have a lot of tenant farmers and small purchasers, I would not, ex and people who just need this stuff, especially the metalworking stuff, to do their jobs and create their sustenance. I would not necessarily expect to see signs of that boycott, but also being aware of just how revolutionary, how early Central Duchess is, because the revolution doesn't really hit Poughkeepsie until May of 1776, which is one of the reasons why they have the organizing meeting for the revolution in Duchess County out here in August of 1774. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of this, these English imperial goods begin to drop off the scanner. I also wouldn't be surprised if Joseph and Samuel saw the writing on the wall and ordered a bunch of stuff in, because just because it would be politically convenient to stop drinking tea and chocolate doesn't mean you're going to make that sacrifice, especially if you're addicted to caffeine. Yes, Steve? And, uh, remember also, when we say tea, we, we assume we know what that means. But in point of fact, there are so many herbal concoctions that are locally that people would be drinking. So to buy a tea in store is a luxury item because there are so many plants and, and native produce. And my, in my family, my grandmother's side is Wappinger Indian. And the thought of buying a tea, I mean, it just wouldn't happen. It's always seasonal that you would take. So David just emphasizes that point that tea is an elite good in this context because there were local versions of it that could be. Sir, you had a question. Yeah, uh, do you have any information about the chain of custody of this document? How it came to the. Uh, I do not. That's a question for the society. So Jenny reports that this document, among many other treasures in the Historical Society's collections, were saved at the dump by a former trustee. Yeah. So make friends with your garbage disposal phones. I mean, it's true. One of the first things I did Thank you, uh, Robert, for reminding me of that. Ten years ago, when I became county historian, was to make friends with um, all of the DPW buildings people at the county who emptied the trash cans, let them know if they saw anything that looked interesting, bring it here before you throw it away. And there's some things that have turned up, including probably the last surviving graphic of what uh, phase three of urban renewal in the Market Street corridor in Poughkeepsie was supposed to look like, that uh, just ended up beside a trash can because it was too big to fit in the trash can when the legislature was cleaning out one of their closets. Yes. We've also uh, inherited by default so many items, things that uh, one generation would say, who wants 
past those. Who can even read them? And they either go to the dump or some of them have been rescued, or that you can in contact with the historical society. Mm -hmm. And a good example are uh, letters sent from World War I, mm -hmm. correspondence from uh, soldiers who sent it to their family and back and forth that had been saved. But at this point, no one's interested or might not even know who those people are. Mm -hmm. So when you're going through your great grandmother's attic or a box, or what do you do with them? Uh, uh, throw them out. Yes. And, and that's the reality for all of us in history. It is. It is very sad. So you know, think about what you have in your possession that's historic, and think about where it should go later on. Well, thank you all. I see Robert is standing up, so that is my signal to. <laughs> This is great. I really learned a lot, enjoyed a lot. We have some cookies here if you want a cookie on the way out. Um, if we don't have your email address and you want to give it to us, we're creating an email distribution list, so there's a, a sign up there as well. All right, let's thank Will one more time.